Tamam, Anzo. So we met one year ago when I came here to teach the Dharma and today again uh, we meet and I am going to teach once again so I'd like to greet all of you. So the topic I've been asked to talk about is how we should begin our daily prayers. So essentially this is going to involve generating the correct motivation for undertaking our daily prayers. And within the correct motivations one generates, here in particular I'm going to talk about refuge, which turns away from the wrong paths, and also giving rise to the mind of bodhicitta. So please try your best to pay attention to these teachings and keep in mind that this is an opportunity for you to improve on your dharma knowledge. So therefore, although I'm not following a text or teaching many pages of any particular treatise, over these eight sessions, I'm going to give a very down-to-earth, easy-to-understand, simple explanation that I think will be of benefit. So I'd like to um, ask you to please keep in mind that this is an opportunity for you to still improve your knowledge. We are all Buddhist, and most of us <clears throat> engage in daily prayers. And as you have noticed, at the start of these daily prayers is always this verse of refuge, right? I go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Supreme Assembly, and so forth. So since that is foundational to our daily prayers, I'm going to talk a little bit about this verse. So primarily, we need to understand the importance of refuge, and likewise, the imp uh, importance of bodhicitta, but first starting with refuge. This verse is almost always recited at the beginning of any Dharma teaching or any puja session. However, you might notice in some pujas like the Lama Chopa puja you perform on the 10th and the 25th of every month that although this exact verse is not present, its meaning is present because it is recited in a more extensive fashion. So fundamentally, it is still there. So on the one hand, it's ubiquitous everywhere. But on the other hand, that might make you, in a sense, uh, not pay much attention to it, right? Ignore it or look down upon it because it's something that you always come across. It starts not to feel special, but we need to understand how foundational it really is. So as I said before, refuge is a mind that protects from the lower paths. Now, when we, as Buddhists, engage in refuge and consider ourselves Buddhists, it's not, a, it's not something that's external to the person, right? You don't observe somebody's practice of Buddhism primarily by looking at their external behavior and then gauge to what level their practice is. That's not how it works. Buddhism um, is fundamentally an internal mental process. And therefore, if you have this mind of refuge in the Three Jewels, you are a Buddhist, right? One is not determined to be a Buddhist based on one's heritage. For example, if your parents are Buddhist, that doesn't automa automatically make you a Buddhist. And likewise, if your parents are not Buddhist, that doesn't uh, auto make you automatically not make you a Buddhist, right? It depends on whether or not you have this mind of refuge. So there can be different levels of refuge in the sense that some people are far more studied with respect to Buddhism and they have a far deeper understanding of refuge. But that doesn't take away from the average Buddhist person's refuge, because fundamentally, if they have a very basic refuge in the Three Jewels, they are still Buddhist, right? Even if they don't have vast understanding of what they go to refuge in. So, if you fulfill certain conditions, 
for refuge, then you are a Buddhist, right? It's it's not that complicated. So that being said, if your actions are qualified by a proper motivation and refuge, then they become dharma, right? So we're talking about refuge in the three jewels, but refuge alone doesn't automatically make one Buddhist because refuge is a concept that is pervasive to all religions and even day-to-day non-religious uh, activities. For example, a patient in the hospital takes refuge in their doctor to be able to cure them, or a child takes refuge in their parents to be able to take care of them. So refuge is something that comes about when we're in a moment of being scared, for example. We put our hopes in another to protect us from something. So in the case of Buddhists, we put our hopes in the three jewels to protect us from the frights of the lower realms. In this world, there are those who are non-religious and likewise many who are religious. And among those who are religious, there are those who practice religions that don't involve uh, an understanding of difficult views or um, tenets. For example, those who worship elements of nature, trees, rocks, and so forth, and are more uh, ritualistic in nature. And then there are those religions that fundamentally are based on complicated uh, viewpoints and tenet systems. And among those, probably um, the most uh, well-known would be the Indian traditions of Buddhism and what is now today known as Hinduism. There are, of course, also the other great uh, tradi religious traditions of the world, such as Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. But if we take it back to Buddhism, Buddhism is not a religion that asserts a creator god. And that is also a way you can divide these greater religions in the world that follow a set of tenets and viewpoints by whether or not they believe in a creator god. So Buddhism does not believe in a creator god because Buddhism instead substitutes the need for that with the presentation of interdependence, of causality, and also karmic causality. So the Buddha, not being a creator god, instead was the one who taught uh, people what is necessary to practice and what is necessary to abandon in their conduct. And the Buddha famously said, I simply show you the path, whether you achieve liberation depends entirely upon you. Buddha was not the creator of the world. He was simply another one who came to show us what to adopt and what to discard in our conduct. And because, as we said, that liberation relies entirely upon ourselves, that puts the onus on us completely. For example, in other traditions, if they follow the word of God, then everything works out for them. If they don't, they still pray to God to um, fix things for them, right, and make it all better. But that's not the case for Buddhists, right? Whether things go right or wrong entirely depends upon our own conduct. So the Buddha was not enlightened from the very beginning. He was first a sentient being wandering within samsara, just like ourselves, right? Just as it is said in the stories of his previous lifetimes, right? But Shakyamuni Buddha at some point gave rise to the aspiration towards perfect enlightenment and then spent three great eons accumulating merit and finally became enlightened. We, however, are still under the control of cherishing ourselves, and therefore we are left behind in samsara. So to reiterate, the Buddha 
was not free from all faults and possessed of all qualities from the beginning. And what this should show us is that if we likewise put in the effort, we can also reach a state where we are free from all faults and possessed of all perfect qualities. So we should think about this point very well. When the Buddha first taught the Dharma, he taught the Four Noble Truths. Of course, you have all heard this presentation many times. Nonetheless, the Buddha taught the Dharma first by way of the Four Noble Truths, and he first said that within ourselves there is suffering, and that suffering has a cause, and that cause is known as the origins. So the first point the Buddha made was that we must identify our situation of suffering. If one does not identify the fault present, then one does not think to seek out its cause. It's exactly the same as the situation of a sick person, right? First, the person understands that they are ill, and then they go to a doctor who can identify the cause and provide the remedy that one then adopts. So we are in a situation of suffering, and suffering doesn't just mean this feeling of suffering that we normally uh, identify suffering as, right? For example, our aggregates are said to be true sufferings. Now, I don't know about in other languages, but in Tibetan, there is a clear difference between the terms suffering and true sufferings. True suffering doesn't necessitate that we're talking about a feeling of suffering, right? It's much more inclusive as a term. So mainly when we hear the term true suffering or truth of suffering, we identify that as our aggregates, right? Because our aggregates are the source of all suffering, right? Merely adopting these aggregates, which are faulty by nature, leads to all the problems in our lifetimes and all other sufferings. True sufferings are divided into three. The suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and all pervasive suffering. So the first, the suffering of suffering, is what we can all identify as suffering. That's simply these feelings of suffering. The second, the suffering of change, is most of our experiences of happy feelings. Because happy feelings are, at the end of the day, a cause for suffering again. For example, if it's really hot outside and you're suffering from that, you come inside in the cool air to alleviate yourself of that feeling of suffering. And when you're sitting in the cool air, you have a feeling of happiness, but it doesn't stay for a very long time. It's not consistent. Eventually, when you stay too long in the cool air, what happens? You start to suffer again, right? So it turns back into suffering. And likewise, if you are walking for a very long time and you want to sit down to relieve yourself, you sit down, you feel a bit better, but if you sit for too long, again, you become uncomfortable and what was once a happy feeling again becomes a feeling of suffering. So that is what the suffering of change means, that whatever temporary happiness you experience will turn back into suffering because fundamentally it is not a happiness. It is not rooted in a reliable cause that makes it stay as a happiness. The third type of suffering is called all-pervasive suffering. And as I said before, that is posited as our aggregates. So this year with Gishi something, you went through and finished the entire of the Lamrim, and I'm very happy to hear about that. And you would therefore know that in the Lamrim there are in-depth explanations of what this third type of suffering is. So since you've already received 
a, a commentary on it, it's good if you go back again and read it to solidify your understanding of this, because this is a very important point. In the smaller scope presentation, it mainly focuses on the suffering of suffering. For example, by talking about the suffering of the lower realms and uh, understanding and recognizing that that is a suffering that we do not want. When you get to the middle scope explanation, it focuses more on the faults of samsara as a whole. And to do that, it brings in the explanation of all pervasive suffering. And within this, it then identifies that our aggregates are in fact this all-pervasive suffering. Our aggregates are the cause of the other two sufferings, right? They're the source of it all. For example, if someone has a stomach ulcer or a cancer for many years, after some time it starts to well after some time it starts to manifest itself in different ways as uh, different illnesses. You go to the doctor and they check what is causing all your physical problems and then they identify it's actually this cancer in your stomach that's causing all your problems, right? That's the basis of it all. That's just like our fundamental problem of having these aggregates right? They are the cause of all of our suffering. So whatever attitude you are trying to engender, whether it be a correct mind of refuge or bodhicitta, fundamental to those is an understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Since we're on the topic of Lamrim, I just remembered something I wanted to say. I'm aware that at the center that you continue to study the Lamrim with a Geshe. And this year I heard about your classes and I also know that last year you had classes going on and this is fantastic. I'm really happy to hear it because the practice of Buddhism is not complete through prayers and pujas alone, right? through inviting the Buddhists to come and so forth, they're not going to solve all of your problems. That is simply a supplement to your main practice, which you must undertake yourself. As the Buddha said, self liberation relies upon oneself. So just praying is not going to get one to liberation. And Still, it is important to recollect that Shakyamuni Buddha at one point was just like us in our situation. And then through his practice and development, he became what is now our refuge. So to get to that point requires a practice that is based on a lot of study, right? A lot of understanding of Buddhism. Um, because Buddhism isn't, a religion where you're correcting your, for example, something physical, right? It's, you're not operating on yourself and removing some sort of negativity and then everything is perfect. It's a, it's a reevaluation and correction of your mental attitude, right? You need to constantly improve and evolve your mind. So in order to transform your mind, you need a lot of study as your foundation to understand how to do so. If you think of the monks in the monasteries, they study 20 to 30 years and they become a geshi and then they continue to study, right? It doesn't stop there. There are a hundred volumes of the Kangyur, right? The word of the Buddha and more than 200 volumes of the Dengira, which is the Indian commentaries. <clears throat> and then on top of that, there are hundreds of volumes of commentaries explaining their meaning from Tibetan masters. And individual Tibetan masters can have up to 10 or 20 volumes commenting on all of that. And it's not possible for us to study all of this in this lifetime. If you look at your current situation, primarily you're very busy with your own lives. So how could you possibly study all of this? So that being said, 
a treatise or a, a style of text that can help you understand what you need to practice from start to finish on the path that helps all levels of practitioners, whether they know a lot or a little, is the Lumrim literature. <clears throat> and Lumrim literature can be texts that are only a few pages long or up to hundreds and hundreds of pages long. So it's for me, I'm very, very happy to hear that in this center you are choosing Lumrim texts and teaching them again and again. Because once is not enough, right? It's not enough to study the Lumrim once and think, I've heard this, I don't want to hear it again, right? And because you have studied it at least once, it's important not to just let it go, right? Even in your busy day-to-day -day life, if you can set aside a portion of your day, even 10 or 20 minutes, to just reread or go over st your study material of the Lamrim, that's highly beneficial, right? Because all of the information and teachings contained in the 100 volumes of the Kangyur and the over 200 volumes of the Dengyur is all contained in the Lamrim. So, don't leave your studies of the Lamrim as some sort of passive study that you listen to, it's done, you move on, right? It is important that you study the Lamrim again and again, request the teachings again and again. With respect to true origins, it's a true origin because it is the cause of our suffering. Right? It is at the root of our suffering. So true origins are divided into two. True origins that are karma and true origins that are afflictions. So what is karma? Karma is an action. It's a deed. right? And in this context, we're talking about negative actions or negative deeds that are the origins of suffering. So we accumulate or are involved in negative karma due to afflictions, right? So our suffering in this life is due to a karma that we accumulated either in our previous life or in this life, right? So we did something negative either before or even in this life, a non-virtue can give rise to suffering in this very lifetime. In the Lamrim, um, it explains karmic causality in a lot of depth. And because you've studied this, you will be quite familiar with what I'm saying. So afflictions are at the root of karma, right? Of bad karma. Under the power of afflictions, we accumulate a karma and uh, therefore, we need to identify what the afflictions are that are causing us to accumulate such negative, uh, negative deeds. And this is complicated because now we start to use technical terms, right? An affliction is what is called a mental factor. And there are many different types and divisions of mental factors that also need to be understood. But I think without going into that on a very general level, you can think of a, an affliction that is a mental factor as some sort of a feeling or attitude. And in fact, because it's so difficult to come up with the correct terminology for things such as afflictions, there have been authored so many commentaries that try to explain it. And for your purposes, if you study texts that are related to minds and mental factors, that will help you get a, a better idea of what the afflictions actually are. And also you can utilize treatises such as Lamrim to help you identify what afflictions are. So for now, we need to understand that from afflictions that are true origins, we accumulate karma, true origins of karma, which give rise to true sufferings. So I've given a very rough explanation of the first two truths among the Four Noble Truths, right? True sufferings and true origins. 
So next, what would follow is an explanation of true cessations and true paths, <clears throat> but perhaps we can go into that uh, at a later time. So today I'm going to leave it here with respect to my explanations. We've covered a little bit about what Buddhism is and what separates it from other religions. Right, we've gone roughly over the Four Noble Truths. And of course, you can go into great depths within the explanation of the Four Noble Truths. They are so vast because all of the Buddhist teachings can be subsumed into them. Right? The Buddha first taught the Four Noble Truths at Varanasi. And therefore, we commemorate that day with like the wheel turning day and so forth. Right? That pertains to the Four Noble Truths. We could also go into much depth about it with respect to the different philosophical tenet systems, but mainly because our topic in these sessions will pertain to refuge and bodhicitta. Some sort of fundamental understanding of the Four Noble Truths is important for you to engender correct attitudes of refuge and bodhicitta. So I will leave that there, and I'm also going to leave the class here for today because you've all been very busy since this morning. Um, it's Tribe Rinpoche's birthday today, and um, I know you've all been involved in preparing for that. And just to say something about uh, the Lama's birthday, it's a fantastic occasion to accumulate great waves of merit when one celebrates one's Lama's birthday. Even if one's motivation is not perfectly correct, right? Even if one does not have a, a high understanding that leads to very correct refuge and bodhicitta, because this is an act, right? Your celebration of his birthday is an act that relates to the Lama. It still becomes a cause for achieving Buddhahood, right? Such is the power of deeds that relate to the Lama. So um, we'll leave it there for today. If you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer them, and then we'll finish the class. Questions? Anybody? You can raise your hands. I don't need to be shy. Oh, Dr. Yip. Can I ask the Rinpoche just now mentioned about the all pervasive suffering is um, sort of uh, rooted in the uh, aggregates. Maybe uh, can I request Rinpoche to elaborate a bit more and how does that uh, relate to the greater scope um, uh, for or the lamb rim, right, for us to, uh, uh, to um, remove or to reduce this suffering? Yes, yes, purify this suffering, yes. Sophie, you got that? Yeah, so how does the... Um, third suffering, all pervasive suffering, which Rinpoche posited as the aggregates. Um, first of all, could Rinpoche please elaborate on that? But how does that relate to the great scope and removing suffering in the context of and the how? great scope of the Lamb Room, I believe? Okay, so all pervasive suffering, we said, is the cause for the other two types of suffering, for the suffering of suffering and the suffering of change. And that all-pervasive suffering we posited as our aggregates. So not only is it the cause for suffering, it's the basis upon which we're experiencing that suffering as well, right? It's the complete package of suffering. So since we've already taken upon ourselves these aggregates, there's not much we can do now to change their nature, right? In this lifetime, we're sort of stuck with what we have for now. So what we can do is change our attitude, right? Change our mind. We can recognize the suffering nature of these aggregates and also recognize that we have achieved a uh, human rebirth with certain leisures and opportunities that we can utilize to practice the Dharma. And that Dharma being, for example, the Lamrim, which you have studied. Of course, these aggregates eventually change. For example, when you get to a higher level of practice, you attain what is called the body in the nature of mind, or the illusory body, the rainbow body, or 
the body which possesses the 32 major marks and 80 mi minor signs. So that's what happens in the future when you get to higher and higher states. But for now, what we're stuck with is aggregates that are all pervasive suffering, right? Because they are not only the cause for future suffering, they are the basis upon which we experience suffering right now. So we need to use those to practice Dharma, right? Because these aggregates aren't going anywhere. As I said, in future, um, we will get to a point where our body will be that which is in the nature of mind or that which possesses certain marks and signs. But now it's not the case. And for example, before you achieve Buddhahood with such a body of certain marks and signs, let's take, for example, the bodies of bodhisattvas, right? Bodhisattvas, when they reach a certain level, are said to have a body similar to ours, but they don't experience the suffering that we would if they were to give away their head or give away their arms and body parts, body parts and so forth, right? So it's a similar body, but their experience of suffering is different. So uh, this is what happens when you advance and progress in your spiritual practice. Awesome.